Well, I want to thank um, Christina in particular and, and Lionel um, and everybody who's working this uh, wonderful event, uh, the speakers who've spoken so far. Um, I've learned many things already with many more to come. Um, so I'm very grateful. I'm honored to be here with you, you know, with you all. I do feel like I find myself in a somewhat daunting position. Um, Keith, I'm going to echo you perhaps a little bit leading off a meeting of scholars who have thought long and deeply about the Citizenship Act of 1924, um, being in the company of illustrious folks, such as my friend Ned Blackhawk, the author of the acclaimed book, Rediscovery America, um, Dave Wilkins, who has written so much over the years, reminding us um, of the, the importance of the sort of legal and political aspects of this, Maggie Blackhawk, one of our sort of esteemed native legal scholars, and so many of you. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, and when I contemplated uh, kind of a long time ago what I might uh, talk about, how I might frame the Citizenship Act, I imagined my talk centering around four categories, the relatively self-explanatory, restrictive, and expansive, and the less apparent but perhaps more intriguing, ridiculous, and sublime. Alas, when I sat down to actually craft the talk, whatever it was I'd been thinking just was out of my head. I had no idea what it was that I thought, Christina, I was going to say. Um, but I had named these four categories. Uh, I thought they had something interesting to say. I guess I just continue to own them. So let me begin with a few reflections. I will say, as the person standing up here, it's totally worth it to have the door open and the breeze. This is what is happening in my university. So I want to just begin with a few reflections on each and begin with the sublime. So we think of sublime usually in aesthetic terms, often uh, in representations of the natural world or natural law, perhaps something that's lofty, grand, inspired, and inspiring, quasi-spiritual, transcendent, exalted, elevated, worthy, awesome, and awesome. But it's also been a surprisingly fluid descriptor, a categorical refuge, as Ned O'Gorman describes it, for postmodern critical and theoretical projects. And I have to confess, I've appropriated the sublime on more than one occasion myself. And this might, in fact, include things like politics and law. So if we took this refuge seriously, a political sublime, in other words, one might describe both the nation and the citizen as having a strong intertwined claim on its affective grandeur. These are keywords, right, in the classic Raymond Williamsian sense. They are evocative, meaning-making, critical and central kinds of words. So citizen and nation are dialectical, I think. The nation has no meaning without its citizens. They literally constitute the body politic. The citizen has no meaning without the state or the nation or the nation state, which defines, empowers, and enforces the very being of the citizen. Both things, then, are productive forces. And being here in France, I'm happy to use the word in its most Foucauldian sense. The citizen is constituted as the subject of the nation, that is, the social cultural formation that puts that little bit of warmth in your heart, whether you want to admit it or not. When you salute the flag, sing the national anthem, or sitting in a football game, watch the jets fly over, and those kinds of things, or recite political words that are easily cast by Americans as sublime. Things like this. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Dang. <laughs> or this one. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Through such sublimity is the citizen also constituted as the subject of the state, that is, the legal and political mechanisms through which force and violence are contained so as to protect you, the citizen, against your fellows, while at the same time being mobilized to protect you and us, the citizenry, against outsiders. And to that, we might add also protecting ourselves from the mechanisms of the state itself. 
The relationship between citizen, nation, and state can be seen in the abstract as a positive, productive, political sublime. Indeed, one of the reasons often given for the rise of the nation state is that its structures offered individuals new forms of security and predictability. We ceded our individual authority, our shared customary practices, our feudal alliances. We ceded these things to the new jurisdiction of the state. In return, we were able to claim and have enforced on our behalf certain kinds of rights, to speak, to worship, to gather, to live, and so on. When such a system works, even moderately well, its success reinforces the ongoing ideological work that organizes the consent claimed in the Declaration. That warm feeling of nationalism, as Benedict Anderson said so many years ago with the idea of imagined community, that warm feeling attaches itself to the state, even as it validates the citizen. So how could citizenship not be the goal of the immigrant and the freedman? Dwell too long on this political sublime, however, and one is called to move away from the abstractions of theory and toward history instead, the turn toward the world as it is and as it's been, at least as well as we can know it. Such a turn might conjure, might well conjure, a sublime antonym or an antonym, antonym of the sublime. That, of course, would be the ridiculous, the absurd, the unreasonable, the preposterous, the nutty, the idea deserving quite literally ridicule and disrespect. For the nation and the citizen contain awkward contradictions and painful ironies, as we've just heard. As the American political structure offers an ideal set of rights and responsibilities located in the individual, the citizen, in relation to the state, it simultaneously and inevitably constitutes social identities and uneven collectivities. For every amorphous national imagined community that is called into being through the various strategies of memory and publicness, there are also social groups laden with cultural meanings who appear as cracks and fissures in that whole. We can all put together lists of those for whom citizenship is seen as inappropriate or suspect. Such groups appear to be bugs in the system, but they are in fact features, not exceptions. These groups often are the subjects of the restrictive aspects of citizenship. The state produces the citizen, but as it does so, it also claims the power to grant and deny citizenship to supplicants, to patrol inclusion and exclusion, to exercise constant administrative control over the parameters of rights, responsibilities, obligations, and jurisdiction. For every individual welcomed in, theoretically, there are groups of individuals denied entry. All are not welcome. And this doesn't just apply to the United States, right? As we've heard about the Cherokee Nation and the five tribes and many other kinds of things, disenrollment, all sorts of things. So this is part of the dynamic, right, of citizenship. But we can say that the United States made its first political and idealistic formulations of citizenship aimed at the few, the exclusionary. Um, uh, and that exclusionary was aimed at whole or in part at its population. Some women in the early republic were citizens in the abstract. But when it came to the rights and responsibilities part, that citizenship was unreliable. When it came to, for example, voting, or in many places, to the right, the title, and the protection of property, they could not enjoy the full rights of citizenship. Under the new constitution, unmarried women citizens, single or widowed, were literally taxed without representation. There's nothing um, about this that is not rich with irony. In an 1875 Supreme Court case, Minor v. Happerstedt, the court offered this kind of lame, of course women are citizens and always have been kind of disclaimer before then ruling that the equal protection offered by the 14th Amendment did not apply to suffrage, which seemed to the court a state issue, as we've heard, not a constitutional rule to be applied to all citizens. Such distinctions between national and state citizenship rights created a different kind of crack in the sublime ideals. For other groups were, of course, restricted from certain citizenship rights on grounds other than gender. Suffrage rights, which we tend to see as quintessential to citizenship, though um, in the US more um, as a right than a responsibility, these things were in the early republic indexed to the possession of, of course, property. 
property, that thing which is so central to all these conversations. Citizenship proved partial, divided along class lines. There was, of course, nothing partial about the non-citizenship of African-descended peoples, defined in the famous three-fifths clause to be counted only as a fraction when it came to calculating population figures, and subject to both state and federal restrictions on the very possibility of citizenship rights. Across the course of American history, citizenship has been dangled, withheld, made provisional, and sometimes granted in wildly uneven ways. And so this sublime ideal that we hear in our founding documents turns ridiculous on a fairly regular basis. The three-fifths clause, for instance, is basically a math story problem for citizenship involving addition, subtraction, and fractionalization. It could literally appear you know, on a you know, multiple choice test. It begins with the assumption of a large undefined mass of citizens on whom the counting will center. To that are added indentured servants, the assumption being that when their time of service is up, they too, as generally white European immigrants, will be on a path to citizens, uh, citizenship. All other persons, which is to say enslaved people, which could not be said apparently, would be counted as a fraction, reflecting a compromise as to whether one was counting bodies or counting property of which slaves were, of course, both. And so when it came to this foundational moment of American calculation, the restrictive and the ridiculous conspired to destroy any notion of idealistically political sublime citizenship. But of course what matters to most of us here today is the only operation of subtraction found in the three-fifths math problem, which observes that Indians not taxed will not be counted when totting up American populations. Not taxed does not use the word citizenship, but the implication is clear from the beginning Native people were not considered American citizens. And that status was due not only to the racial formations taking hostile shape in that moment, but because those tribal people were considered citizens of their own polities, as Dave had, has pointed out to us today, as if they were, say, French or Spanish or Dutch or kind of inferior versions of the same. On the one hand, it was the ultimate restriction. It named as an impossibility the idea that one might imagine Indians as citizens, as members of the American body politic. But on the other hand, the language of not taxed, which is a practice or an act, not an essentialized status, right? That implies that a native person could in fact take up that specific act, paying taxes, and perhaps be included in the count, perhaps ask for, maybe even be granted citizenship rights and responsibilities. So what's implied then is both separate nationhood and statehood and a kind of naturalization process in which a native person does what, say, a French person might, renounce a prior national citizenship, fulfill some as yet unnamed requirements for American citizenship, swear national allegiance, become a new citizen of the United States, right? A naturalization process. In 1790, Congress passed the first such naturalization act. They were thinking about these questions um, because as a new nation state, they had to. That act set the parameters for eligibility. A free, white, adult, alien, male or female, who had resided within the geographical limits and legal political jurisdiction of the US for two years. So the racial category, white, excluded Indian people, again, even as it affirmed their national difference. It was only one of the many occasions on which the American state restricted and refused Indian access to the American nation and to the American citizenship that wove the two together. There was the Constitution's Commerce Clause, whose grammar suggests tribes were more like foreign nations than like internal states. The Supremacy Clause, which elevates treaties, the primary locus of political relations between the US and tribal nations. The 14th Amendment, which continues to separate out Indians not taxed. And legal cases such as the famous Elk v. Wilkins, which denied native suffrage and called into question the very idea of native, native citizenship, suggesting instead an irredeemable racial loyalty to tribal nations. Well, tribal national distinctiveness points as well to the external element that is present in the making of nations and citizens. If the citizen and the nation exist in a dialectical, mutually constitutive relationship, so too is there an equally powerful equally formative relation between a nation and other nations. 
To be a nation, as Emmer de Vattel argued in 1758, one would have both rights and obligations in relation to these other nations, as was suggested by what he took to be the law of nature. Key to those relations was the mutual recognition of one nation by others, just as individuals were supposed to recognize one another as political subjects. So the American Revolution, in this sense, was a demand for recognition on the part, not simply of England, the original subject of the disunion, but from France and Spain and all those others. That American demand was largely unanticipated. Thus, the strong explanatory language found in the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, et cetera, et cetera, right? This is the rationale for this. Americans were literally declaring their determination to fight for political recognition. The individual rights that they said they wanted in their own state, in their own state nation, nation state, mapped onto the collective rights that they demanded of other nations. In 1776, as the various founders were writing the declaration, John Adams also drafted the Model Treaty, a template for commercial, though not yet military, alliance with France and Spain. It was a bid for the kind of recognition that would become so important during the war. And indeed, in 1778, the US and France would sign two concurrent treaties, one of amity and trade, and another of military alliance. Well, if Adams crafted the template, we can say, good for him, right? Um, but the structure and the language for treaties of amity and trade and of military alliance had already long since been crafted with native peoples. And indeed, just days after the declaration had been declared, Massachusetts representatives signed a treaty of alliance and military support with Maine tribes. The first place Americans turned for the dialectical relation of their own tenuous claim to nationhood and statecraft then was in fact to Indian nations. The 1778 treaty with the Delaware, the United States' first kind of formal legalistic reading treaty, drew upon long-standing concepts of distinctiveness, national recognition, and alliance, even as it invented a new template, elements of which would appear in many treaties in the years to come. In between NASA and NISA, a couple weeks ago, you know, um, my wife and I got on this cool cruise down the Norwegian Fort Fjords, which was just lovely and fantastic and was a kind of viral Petri dish. And uh, <clears throat> so, but I, we even took COVID tests. I just want you to know, I just have a little <clears throat> coffee thing that's about to start. Mm -hmm. So the revolution was not only a war for external recognition and internal nation state dynamics, it was also a war for property. The kind of property in land that would prove essential in defining the first generation of property holding American citizens. The plan to pay continental soldiers through land script required vast tracts of Indian land. The Sullivan campaigns in the Haudenosaunee territory were basically land scouting ventures followed almost immediately by speculation. We all know how crazy Ohio was in the wake of the Revolutionary War. George Washington and his inner circle proved among the largest landholders in the New Republic. Um, the violence and land sessions that followed made it clear that a key factor in declaring independence was the rejection of British restrictions on settlement. This is our equivalent of a 1619 argument, basically, and I think it's one that actually has much more um, in the, in the, you know, m more legs, more weight, you know, to it. The passage of the Land Ordinance of 1785, which laid out the survey structure for expansion, and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which established the colonial to imperial structure of the nation state itself, right, how colonies join the empire. These things both evidence the urgency of land acquisition and management to the political structure of the state and the developing national sensibilities of its citizens. Land was abstracted, rationalized, made into property, and through loan and foreclosure tactics, as Casey Park reminds us, turned into a massive, fluid pool of magical capital 
was the American equivalent of the New World gold and silver that helped jumpstart capitalism itself in the 16th century. Indeed, the triangulation, or it's a quadrangulation, I think, of joyful land hunger, metaphysical Indian hating, celebratory American nationalism, and administrative state formation was nothing if not a new manifestation uh, of a new political sublime, an American political sublime, transcendent and terrifying as any Wordsworthian venture into the mountain storm for readers of the prelude. So Native peoples. Native peoples pr proved key ideological and political figures in the relation between new American nationhood and American citizenship. They were one of the excluded others that defined the national citizen. They were the external nations on the border, among the first to recognize the United States as a nation. They were the possessors of land that needed to be turned into property to both fund the nation and define its citizens. And they were caught up in one of the central matters that a state must take on. Not simply the rights and responsibilities of its citizens, but the extension and management of its jurisdiction the claim to political and legal control over both geographies and people. The 1790 Trade and Intercourse Act took on this question, which had been previously part of nation-to-nation -nation treaty negotiations. The act meant to govern the Indian trade, to be sure, uh, to centralize land session treaties and purchases, to manage unruly traders through licenses, fees, and fines. But Congress also sought to extend American jurisdiction over crimes perpetrated by white Americans against Native people or other Americans while in Indian territory. The US rejected the Indian exercise of Indian justice on Indian lands, insisting that a racial national American citizenship was inherently superior to Native political authority. An analogy, imagine an American in Paris or Bordeaux um, who commits a crime against a French person. The French hold the perpetrator for trial only to find that the United States refuses to recognize French law and instead generously insists on prosecuting its own citizen under American laws. And it gets worse, of course, I'm sorry to say, Lionel. So here at last is an indigenous-centric version of that fourth term, the expansive quality of American citizenship, something more often celebrated um, than questioned. And I think this completely links um, Keith, to your discussion of plenary, plenary power here. Indeed, the story of the 19th and 20th centuries in the United States is often told as an expansive move away from some of the restrictive qualities of those earlier national citizenships. There's the elimination of property rights restrictions and thus the expansion of white male suffrage. There is the extension of civil rights to African-American men following the Civil War the expansions of birthright citizenship in the 14th Amendment, the extension of suffrage rights to women through the 19th Amendment in 1920. So the idea of restrictions, right, in this story appears in vile acts, such as the voting repressions of the Jim Crow South, the attacks on Chinese immigration and naturalization, the sweeps of Mexican-American citizens in the repatriation campaigns of the 1930s, the Japanese internment camps of World War II where the expansion of citizenship is almost seen as a universal good, though plagued with these unfortunate exceptions, indigenous encounters, as we know, have proved more complicated. One might suppose that if you were an American in Bordeaux about to be tried under French law, or a white American about to be tried under native legal traditions, you would appreciate the extension of American jurisdiction on, as part of your citizenship rights. But if you are French or native, you would be justifiably outraged. The law of nations, mutual rights and obligations, was being thrown over to advance the interests of one nation and its citizens. It was an imperialistic political sublime in the most literal sense. So in North America, the Trade and Intercourse Act and the treaties and the laws and the legal decisions that, found it, uh, that followed marked the beginning of the American restriction of native national jurisdiction over citizens and territories. Take, for example, the case of William Rogers and Jacob Nicholson. Both men were Cherokees, given the complex um, provisions for Cherokee citizenship, um, Augustine, that you uh, outlined for us earlier. They lived in the Cherokee Nation for years. They'd married Cherokee women. Indeed, the men were brothers-in-law, had been recognized by the Cherokee government um, as citizens, at least in some shape or form. In 1844, Rogers stabbed Nicholson to death 
In theory, the United States should have had no jurisdiction over them, and that was Rogers' claim. But the question for American courts, as Eric Chiffetz has argued, was what kind of Cherokee Rogers was. Neither man was born Cherokee. They were white Americans who had naturalized to the Cherokee Nation. That would be something that would be entirely consistent with the nobility, the political mobility of the sublime ideal, right, of the liberal rights-bearing individual who can move, right, between national polities. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so as we understand the logic of Indians not taxed and the mutual recognition that structured the law of nations, Rogers' claim was probably a legitimate one. But evoking the 1834 version of the Trade and Intercourse Act, this was the last of them, um, an American grand jury claimed jurisdiction, insisting that the white racial identity of the murderer trumped his Cherokee citizenship and thus trumped Cherokee territorial jurisdiction. So was Rogers a sublimely political Cherokee citizen or racially white? and therefore inevitably American. When the case made its way to the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Roger Taney emphasized race over Indian nationhood, citizenship, and naturalization, the very process of naturalization. He confidently narrated an entirely fictitious history of US indigenous relations, as courts have done consistently with Indian cases. Thank you for Dave, Dave and Maggie for schooling us constantly on the, 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 the lying history of the Supreme Court. For, for Tawney, in, in 1844, Cherokee territory was owned by the United States, not by Cherokees. They'd been assigned to their land, which was granted only with the assent of the US government. No tribe, he opined, had ever been viewed or treated as an independent nation. Europeans had always claimed and exercised dominion over tribal territories, and no white American could possibly leave the US sovereignty behind, immigrate to an Indian nation, be naturalized into tribal citizenship, and seek jurisdiction under tribal law. These things were impossible. Rogers' claim to Cherokee jurisdiction was forcibly denied. American citizenship was forcibly extended. Cherokee national citizenship was reduced. And we should note uh, that this is the same Tawney who narrated almost exactly the opposite story in the famous Dred Scott decision. So this kind of move, right, utterly fictional, ruthlessly imperialistic, proved to be quintessentially American when it came to native citizenship and nationhood over the course of the 19th century. It developed as something of a playbook relentlessly attack tribal government as, at best, a deeply inferior, not quite political structure, incapable of managing such a thing as tribal citizenship. Second, emphasize that the individual was the only location for considering the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Third, extend American jurisdiction over territory, offenses, and people. And of course, one culminating moment, as we know, came with the Cherokee cases of the early 1830s, in particular John Marshall's dicta in Cherokee v. Georgia case that invented a new status for native people, domestic dependent nations. It is unsurprising then that the most vigorous extensions of American jurisdictional claims over tribal citizens should take place during the post-Civil War allotment period, when the individualization of land was accompanied by the promised extension of American citizenship rights. And much, though not all, of Indian country had been militarily contained and apparently pacified. As many people know, I, I reject that argument about pacification in that particular time period until much later. I'd like to push it back later. The hope of the reformers was clear. Indians would reject their tribal affiliations, define themselves as individual liberal subjects, naturalize the United States, pay their taxes, claim citizenship rights, and maybe be counted in a census. This fantasy lay at the heart of dominant federal Indian policy for much of the 19th and 20th centuries, a forced campaign of civilization and assimilation that could produce only a highly compromised and partial brand of citizenship, a ridiculousness that rested on the ironic gaps between the sublimity of American political claim and what emerged as the dialectic of the 19th century. Restrictive measures against tribal authority expansion of uh, assertions of American jurisdiction. So where did citizenship sit within that expansion? One would anticipate, for instance, that Americans would offer a warm and willing embrace to any Indian who wanted to naturalize to the United States. Um, and so we, here we have 
Elk v. Wilkins, John Elk, an English-speaking Ho-Chunk laborer um, who had supposedly renounced tribal citizenship, offered a test case of Americans Welcome. After Charles Wilkins refused to allow Elk to register to vote in the city council election in 1880, lawyers who were sponsored and paid for by outside reform organizations filed a case nine days later. As legal scholar Bethany Berger has shown, Elk was probably less interested in this assimilationist move and more committed to trying to find ways to use citizenship to protect kin and land claims among the native group, the Ho-Chunk, that had been relocated from their lands at least five times and probably more, um, I think, Angel, you would say, and cheated by American government and its citizens at every step of the way. So the Supreme Court, as we know, rejected John Elk, suggesting that even individual taxed Indians who had separated had, in effect, a kind of birthright non-citizenship, right? The court confronted the expansionist policy efforts directed towards an assimilatory citizenship, and they rejected them in favor of deeply racialist restrictions. We can see the ways that like, race is constantly imbricated in all of these political kinds of moments. Individual Indians who sought to claim American citizenship were under the decision always to be considered part of politically separate and distinct peoples. They could claim neither birthright nor naturalized citizenship, but yet at the same time, the American state insisted with increasing force and conviction that Indian people had few to no tribal citizenship rights of their own. The Major Crimes Act of 1885 asserted absolute federal jurisdiction over Indian country for seven major crimes, including murder, kidnapping, and other felonies. It was the same kind of bald-faced expansion of power that we've been looking at. So consider once again our hypothetical American in Paris. In the early years of the relationship, the United States generously allows French people to prosecute French crimes under their own law, but insists that it handle any American committing a crime in France. Then imagine that the US demands jurisdiction over any case in which a French person commits a crime against an American. The US denies that an American can ever become a naturalized French citizen, and then it demands to control cases in France in which French people commit major crimes against other French people. I mean, this is about as ridiculous as it gets. So in 1887, the Dawes Allotment Act, which divided reservations into those parcels assigned to native individuals, offered American citizenship as a final reward. Maybe. Maybe immediately. Or maybe following that 25-year period of occupancy or tutelage. In the first section of the relevant article, each and every member of a tribe that has been allotted will be subject to the laws, both criminal and civil, of the state or territory where they reside. So the act expanded American law yet again, while also extending 14th Amendment equal protection rights, prohibiting states and territories from passing laws that denied such protection. But this was as much jurisdiction as it was citizenship, because in the next sentence, the act goes further, laying out two categories of native people who would become citizens. Every Indian born in the territories claimed by the U.S. who received an allotment under the act was in. So too was every Indian who has voluntarily taken up his residence separate and apart from any tribe of Indians and adopted the habits of civilized life. John Elk, in other words, right? So the language seemed to suggest immediate citizenship for allottees, but this was, of course, contested, and the act was easily interpreted to mean that citizenship, in fact, came at the end of the 25-year period. It all got messy and, if I might say, ridiculous. So first, the Dawes Act exempted 10 Indian Territory tribes and a few others. Uh, but then in 1898, the Curtis Act shut down Indian Territory courts and governance. In 1901, Congress amended the Dawes Act to include the Indian Territory tribes. And in 1906, the Burke Act split the difference on citizenship, codifying that an allotment holder would, in fact, need to wait 25 years or receive a patent to land before becoming a citizen while leaving intact their residence apart from the tribe provision. The Burke Act then excluded the Indian Territory tribes and its provisions for early land patenting opening the way, opened the way after 1914 to the disastrous competency commissions, which handed out patents like candy. In 1919, Congress granted citizenship to Native people who had served in the nation's military or naval establishments independent of individual tribal rights. As my colleague Lila, Lila Teeters Knoll has surveyed and summarized, in the years before the Citizenship Act, there were multiple ways for an Indian person to become an American citizen, all largely and mutually incoherent. There was 
allotment pre-1906, immediate citizenship, maybe. There was post-1906 Burke Act citizenship with a patent after 25 years. There was citizenship with a patent before 25 years as judged by the Competency Commission. There was separation from the native nation, which was a kind of vague thing, right? You wrote a letter to someone saying something. Some treaty provisions, as we know, included citizenship. Marriage to a white person could be the basis of citizenship. A specific act of Congress could, be, uh, could lead to citizenship. Giving birth, where Lila found this, I'm not entirely sure. Giving birth to two citizen it is Indians could become grounds for citizenship. And a sort of open, generic category, fill in the blank here, lots of other kinds of ways to sort of figure it out. So by the early 19th century then, the situation had become ridiculously unclear. The United States demanded Indian assimilation to the social, cultural, economic, and political systems of the nation. U.S. frequently denied American citizenship that would logically have come with such assimilation. And where such citizenship was indeed possible, it was hopelessly confused and usually riddled with land greed and corruptions. Readers of, say, Luther Standing Bear will recall the bureaucratic runaround awaiting those who pursued U.S. citizenship and emancipation from the oversight of the Indian agent. At the same time, the U.S. actively worked to destroy tribal governments and their independent citizenships, which were, in fact, deeply rooted in American constitutional and political history. So the movements and claims toward the expansion of citizenship, the fulfillment of the sublime idealism of America, and most often framed around the experiences of black Americans. This operated to negative effect for native people. For as the US sought to destroy the tribal, it left Indian people with no good options. In effect, the sublime and productive relation between citizen and nation had been severed on not one, but two fronts, the American national front and the tribal national front. And the dialectical relation between a nation and other nations had been severed as well, at least when it came to native people and native polities. So the question of Indian citizenship in the early 20th century might have played out in other ways if we imagine, if we think counterfactually. Americans might have continued, for example, to deny the very possibility of American citizenship for Indian people, staying in line with the national and racial distinctions visible in the Three-Fifths and Commerce Clauses, the 14th Amendment, L.V. Wilkins, these things. But such a course would mark the continuity or continuation of the possibilities of tribal citizenship, which would take us back to the original sublime, we might say, logic of the Constitution, right? And the ways in which the United States gained its own visibility and its own identity through its relation with other, other nations. Well, alternatively, the US might have offered an opt-in citizenship in which native individuals could choose American citizenship so as to create for themselves a dual citizenship that might fit their own circumstances as they understood them. The default in that system, however, would be the fully tribal citizenship, a kind of different form of recognition of the constitutional logic of separate nationhood, but this time with a kind of assimilatory naturalizationist kind of bent or twist. You could opt in literally choosing to incorporate American citizenship. Or, as a third alternative, Congress might have offered an opt-out citizenship, which assumed that while some Indian people might choose to actively step away from American citizenship, most would simply go with it. Such an option would assume, as the default, a dual citizenship, American and tribal national, while leaving individuals the ability to choose one or the other, but you'd have to actively reject American citizenship. As we know, the ICA chose none of those possibilities, mandating instead a non-consensual citizenship that gave Native people no choices other than dual or American citizenship. In that sense, it represented the logical extension of allotment and assimilationist policy, a continuation of the expansion of American jurisdiction through a new and potentially dangerous American mode. And I think it's really important for us to kind of think hard about what that mode actually looks like of citizenship. What does land loss look like? Keith, I think you're exactly right on this. Um, you know, what does land loss look like in terms of sort of the citizenship regime? 
right? I think we're talking about assessors and tax collectors and all of these kinds of things, right? Which I'm not so sure we've dug into in the kind of detail that we maybe, you know, maybe ought to be thinking about. It also suggests, you know, to me that the sort of, as, as cool as it is for us to do Supreme Court decisions and even to think about state level kinds of things, that so much of these citizenship things are contested and fought out at the local level, right? This is where like vagrancy laws, drunkenness laws, disorderly conduct laws, all of these kinds of things, the ways in which settler colonialism makes its way into American law at the local level and is enforced, right? The criminalization of native people at that level feels to me like one of these things that we can really sort of dig into um, and explore. So given that dual citizenship was not allowed in the US until 1967, the Citizenship Act, the dual citizenship part, seems like a concession or perhaps even a progressive mood. In reality, at least conceptually, it had the effect of retaining tribal nationalism while diminishing it at the same time. Yet another manifestation of the ways that these confused dialectics, helpfully but not entirely framed around the trope of domestic dependent nations, continued a steady, a complex but steady diminution of the self-determining nation citizen political powers needed to maintain indigenous nationhood. There seem to me several ways of thinking about these worlds that collided in the years leading up to 1924. There is a sublime vision of the expansion of American citizenship as a good, an extension of rights and protections. If one imagines citizenship as a gift, as many reformers did, then it made sense to include native peoples. As Secretary of the Interior Franklin Lane argued in 1919, in my judgment, the controlling factor in granting citizenship to Indians should not be based on their ownership of lands, tribal or in severalty, in trust or in fee, but upon the fact that they are real Americans and are of right entitled to citizenship. This sounds very familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> well, there was a similar native vision, adjacent and parallel, but not born of the same optimism. As Chinina Lomaiwema and others, many others have suggested, for instance, the elite intellectuals of the Society of American Indians thought American citizenship might offer Native people access to American legal systems, um, which would allow them a more active opportunity to protect their lands from the many encroachments of American colonialism, albeit in the context of individual holdings rather than tribal, uh, tribally collective ones, and offer the opportunity to sort of intervene in some sort of fashion within American political kinds of structures. Um, I mentioned Chinina in part because, you know, she, I remember her very clearly saying this to me in 2011, Chad, at the conference that you organized on the 100th anniversary of the Society of American, um, uh, the, at the SAI, Society of American Indians meeting, um, where we reconvened in Columbus, um, on Columbus Day, actually, as I recall, we replicated the whole thing. So here we are with these 200 year anniversaries, right, with these lovely, marvelous conferences, um, and here's one that, Yours is actually speaking to this one, you know, for me here. So there's a couple of visions, but here's the third one. On the other hand, the third hand, many tribes recognize the negative consequences of the expansion of American citizenship, which was, they understood, of a peace with American land acquisitions and the expansions of American jurisdiction and settler colonialism. As Lila Teeters Knoll has shown, some resisted on um, internal cultural nationalist kinds of grounds, particularly in the Southwest. Others, particularly with Haudenosaunee, in the context of the League of Nations internationalism and longstanding international treaties. And then finally, there's the sort of 30,000 foot view that I've been trying to take and which others have taken here today in which citizenship functions as yet another imperial tool in a colonial arsenal, leading quickly to the newly expansive work of the tax collector, the tax assessor. Because it turns out that Indians not taxed was not simply about counting, it was also about condemning and seizing property. So and if we think about this as one giant centuries long exercise of eminent domain, now we get to see it play out in yet another form. So the 1924 Act, like so many pieces of legislation, looked to clarify the usual American political mess. It was characteristically optimistic, proposing a new kind of ideal, a sublime solution, one that clearly drew upon the many debates surrounding immigration, assimilation, and citizenship unfolding in the first decades of the 20th century. 
But without real citizenship rights, U.S. citizenship became one more mode of surveillance and control, registration, census, taxation, these kinds of things. The longed for goal for so many other people, right? So many other people, the individual rights of the citizen, legibility before the state, these things could be mobilized to advance the colonial project in yet another of its many manifestations when it came to native people. Non-consensual jurisdiction without recourse had led to non-consensual citizenship of a very limited nature. Because as we know, much of the daily work of the nation and the citizen takes place at the state and local level, where the nation's sublime dreams meet the ironic ridiculousness of American discrimination in all of its many forms. The United States has, in effect, constituted the relation between nation and citizen along three primary axes. First, there's been a long-running internal conversation, mutually constitutive, around rights, obligation, jurisdiction. Citizens and would-be citizens have turned to an American political sublime, an idealist, transcendent vision of American inclusion and the fullness of citizenship that people have worked hard to transform into a real and expansive practice, right? The perfectibility of America kind of argument that we have there. Second, there's been an equally long-running dialectical practice of mutual recognition between the United States and other nation states, beginning as an aspirational diplomatic history during the Revolution and the early Republic, moving in global directions at the turn of the 20th century as the US acquired offshore imperial holdings, and then coming to a kind of fullness in a post-World War II world defined by American global hegemony. We can place Native people in that context as well. But there's a third relation that is unique to our settler colonial situation um, that describes the, that relation between the United States and Native nations. That relation has always been restrictive from a beginning in which Native people were written into the Constitution in order to be excluded from it to the more recent impositions, the state-federal tensions, the uneven citizenships, the blood quantum regimes um, that come with the IRA, um, the other forms of American statecraft that leave Native people partial and situational citizens of the United States. While at the same time, and perhaps paradoxically, the United States has been equally expansive, just in the wrong ways. Though partially an extension of individual rights, the expansion of American citizenship has worked hand in glove with an effort to extend American jurisdiction and thus to damage and destroy tribal citizenship. It leads us, Keith, I think, to your argument about plenary power and Dave, to your argument, which is, um, as you guys have said, the same. It's been a mechanism for bringing Native peoples under the control of the American state. It has served the interests of the settler colonial project, one more strategy for taking Indian land through the grifting and the graft of individuals to the taxing and seizure schemes of local governments. It has been, frankly, ridiculous in its contradictions, double standards, cynicisms, and confusions. And yet, even as we cycle from the political sublime to the politics of the ridiculous, I think we also might take some hope, right? We might have a glass half empty moment. We might reverse direction once more. We might um, take a cue from many of the international indigenous folks who look to the United States and say, I sure wish I had that treaty relationship. I sure wish I had that sort of, you know, kind of trust sovereignty kind of thing going on. What can I do to get that? For is it not the case that contemporary tribal nations and tribal citizenship, messy though it may be in the present moment, continue to offer new ways of rethinking American politics writ large. When we imagine rights and responsibilities only in terms of the individual, we constrain our thinking. Tribalism, the weirdness of domestic dependent nations, the paradox of simultaneous trust and sovereignty, the possibility of rights and responsibilities read in collective terms, all these things, I think, demand a constant refreshment of new kinds of political imaginaries some of them seemingly ridiculous, at least to the average American, but which are in fact not that, which are in fact potentially a new indigenous form of political sublime coming out of these sort of tortured histories that we have, a new set of possibilities, at the very least a step outside of the deeply carved ruts the oldest American political relationship might be taken as a resource for present and future. Thank you. Thank you.